I'm here today to bring you urgent news about nothingness. <laughs> this is exactly what it appears to be. It's the word zero, made in neon, an invisible gas illuminated for just a second by a spark of invisible currency. It happens also to be the name of an actual American town located at 32 degrees north, 88 degrees west, in the immediate vicinity of another town named Zip City, one named Dot, south and west of none such spec and nameless. These are real towns. This stuff makes me crazy with happiness. <laughs> it's, it's, it's part of a, of a massive 80-foot long installation, like a huge existential void mapped onto the wall of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. All of these names are actual place names taken from actual American towns. One of my favorites is, is a town called Dearth, a town named for the lack of something. It's just irresistible to me. What you're seeing here is, is in, in a way, artistic perfection provided by the American geography. It's three towns named nameless. I just love that quality of paradox. And now I'm going to take you out into the landscape that that piece describes. This is a place not unlike the landscape I grew up in in South Dakota, which is routinely referred to by people in New York as the middle of nowhere, and they have a point. <laughs> we're, we're looking here at a 1972 Winnebago Brave. It's exactly the kind of thing that was always blocking my view on the highway as a kid. It took me 40 years to figure out how to exact my revenge, but I got it. I got a museum to buy it for me, and then I paid this guy at a junkyard to cut it up with a chainsaw. <laughs> I mean, it's simple, it's astonishing, it's unlovely, but I got what I wanted. Here it is on a flatbed truck, all ready to become art. And here it is installed in the museum. I wanted to suspend it because to me, suspended, it was still a recreational vehicle, although more recreation than vehicle at this point, but it was also an idea of itself. But no sooner did I suspend it than I had a conversation, kind of a tough conversation with the curator who felt very strongly it should be suspended at the standard 50-inch viewing height used for every other painting and every other sculpture at the museum. My point to her was if we suspended it at the same height that it would be at if it still had wheels, it was more dignified and respectful. <laughs> this, is, this is my... This is my favorite shot of this piece, because here we're looking at the rear view of the rear view mirrors. And in particular, we're looking at this little slice of nothingness between the walls that are suspended. And I want you to hold that thought, because now we're looking at a little slice of no nothingness on the Upper East Side. This is a, a photographic project, not a sculptural project. I'm going to describe to you how it happened. I was living here at the time. I was walking through the financial district. And I looked up, and I had one of those epiphanies you hope for as a visual artist, which is to see something truly astonishing. And because I'm me, the thing that I saw arguably didn't exist. But I saw what appeared to be a perfect building suspended between other buildings. I started taking photographs and realized that these are, in fact, a kind of building. They're just not conventional buildings. They're not made of conventional materials like steel. They're buildings made of sky. And that became the name of the project. And after pursuing this project off and on, different cities, different years, I came to feel that as an urban dweller, we're all, I, I am, we are, most of us, focused on the wrong thing. We're focused on the built environment, when what actually makes the buildings possible and what makes our lives in cities possible is the invisible city that's wedged in between the buildings. It's really hard to hold the thought of nothingness in your mind. And these buildings come and go. You take a step left or right, or a, a cab honks at you, and, and you lose it. The building disappears. But it will reappear if you wait long enough. This one reappeared with the Chrysler building cast in a supporting role, holding up the left side of the, of the building made of sky. And here's a city made of buildings made of sky. And then eventually, I just wanted the prints as big as I could get them, because I wanted that visceral one-to-one -one identification with that empty space. I wanted the viewer to feel that she could actually step into the invisible city. 
And then I, I wanted a different kind of invisibility. I wanted something that had to do more with an interior space. But to get it, I had to do something hugely visible and very heavy. This is the first truckload of what would become two million sheets of paper delivered curbside on Park Avenue, right outside Lever House. And here's what I did with it. It's a piece called Lever Labyrinth. And my intention was to split the difference between a garden maze and the urban maze, but also to allow the viewer walking through it to encounter himself or herself in that kind of meditative interior space. A lot of people didn't encounter it that way. They just walked by. But a surprising number of them, <laughs> a surprising number of them did detour through the lobby and have that little moment of solitude in the city. My favorite comment by far, I couldn't believe I was lucky enough to overhear this. There were a couple of beefy business guys, and they were kind of muscling their way through the labyrinth. They were plainly irritated. <laughs> their, their leather briefcases were literally scraping up against the sides of these ephemeral stacks of material. And one guy looks at the other. He looks around, and he goes, retarded. <laughs> it, it really happened. And I thought to myself, yes. I, I often make books of my projects. This was no exception. This gives you a hint of my working method, which is circuitous. Most of the inside of the book was made up not of nothing exactly, but of sheets of paper left over from the installation. So the paper was recycled to begin with. Here I've recycled it again. And I've included this shot to remind myself and all of us here that we think of paper as the embodiment of a two-dimensional plane. But really, the part that most interests me is the part, once again, that's almost invisible. It's the edge. You don't even know it's there until you get a paper cut. You get a lot of paper cuts in this line of work. <laughs> so then I wanted to make a piece that was nothing but edges. Um, this is a piece called Yellow Interval in Berlin. It's maybe three or 400,000 sheets of paper. But they're, they're perpendicular to that back wall. So we are seeing only the edges. Now we're back in New York. This is an unusual exhibition space with these coved corners that made it difficult. Uh, this, this wall felt particularly paradoxical because it wasn't really doing its job as a wall, which is to support other things. It was barely even supporting itself. But more than that, it seemed to be a wall built out of this minor miracle, this coincidence of nearly invisible things packed in very tightly against one another. And it's, it's dragging things from invisibility across the threshold of visibility that most intrigues me as an artist. And now I want to describe to you a very different kind of spatial experience, but that nonetheless arises from the same kind of conceptual motivation. So here we are. This is a brand new museum in Colorado. We're in the preparator shop. The preparator is the person who builds the frames and the pedestals and does all the stuff for the exhibition design that isn't art per se. So it's exactly the kind of space you would never have an opportunity to see as a viewer. It's a kind of cultural blind spot in our understanding of the apparatus of museums. So what I wanted to do was find a way to bring the public into these spaces. And I thought I could force the museum's hand if I put the artwork on the wall. Then the only way you could see it is to bring the public into the preparator shop. So I made these paintings that are based very closely on paint chips. Um, I made them big on the wall. And then I put everything right back where it was to begin with. So the telephone went back, the calendar with the muscle cars, the coat hooks, the rulers, the T-squares, everything went back. Some of these were in notionally public places. Um, I tried to be sensitive to the conditions of the site. So this is on the ceiling by the elevator landing. Um, electrical panels, live wire. And, and again, it's just a back hallway, so, so a kind of space you would never normally see. This is the one piece that was in a, an official exhibition area consecrated as such. It's, it's the lobby of the museum. I thought, what an amazing thing that there's actually a color called abstract. And it seems like it's an essentially abstract endeavor to put a word on the wall and to float this big monochrome of color. But at the same time, there's something very specific and concrete about it. It's, it's vast. It occupies a lot of acreage on the wall. But it's also it's just a millimeter thick. It's the thickness of a sheet of paper. And that paradoxical quality of seeming not to be here and then being undeniably here, 
that's, that's just something that I can't get enough of. So if you think of what we've seen so far, we've seen, we've seen places named nameless, rendered in neon. We've seen a recreational vehicle cut down to just a couple of walls and the space between. We've seen buildings made of sky. We've watched walls made out of paper. We've kind of gone on this little labyrinthine journey. And here we are at this other kind of paradox. So I want to leave you with, with one more image. This is a little video clip. Um, last year, I was commissioned by Stanford University to do five permanent installations. And I wanted to do an installation. It, it felt crazy, but I, I had to do it. I wanted to do a monument to the process of transformation. I wanted to make a monument to change itself. This is a piece called Monument to Change as it Changes. So anyone who's been to Grand Central knows the technology. You see it in European train stations a lot. It's these flip digit modules. But instead of having information about arrivals and departures, it's just 80 custom printed colors. And in a sense, it never really arrives anywhere. It just, it just keeps going. That was gratuitous, I admit. 